You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your favorite CCT personality, JTAC extraordinaire, embracer of the ridiculous face, and like the shortest operator you'll ever meet, Peaches. Hey everybody, welcome back to the One's Ready Podcast. We're happy to have you. We have a very special guest today, so we're going to get right into it. We have the Special Operations Command, Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Chief Greg Smith. Now, like I said, we're going to go right into this. So I wanted to hit your background a little bit because you have a, a obviously quite impressive background and you wouldn't be the SOCOM CSO if you didn't have an impressive background, but you actually started off as kind of a weapons loader. Then you went to an AC-130 gunner. Then you, I know, I know you hit a whole bunch on the way, so I'm, I'm definitely summarizing, but then you went to be the SOC, your command chief, then the AFSOC command chief, and now you are the SOCOM C cell. So can you give us a little background on not only your, you know, your kind of personal life and how you got to be where you are, but throughout your career as well, chief. Yeah, thanks, Peach. It's always, again, always good to see you, my friend. Um, so growing up in Detroit, Michigan, son of a Detroit cop, you know, uh, in the late 80s, the Detroit was dying in the sense of uh, the auto industries were moving out, you know, and the, the job opportunities were going away. And just, it was just not a, you know, it was not a good time in terms of future and where to go and what to do. So, um, you know, looking at options, I thought the Air Force was a good option. I was going to go for four years, you know, really think about paying for college and those types of things, the standard story. Uh, joined, became a, you know, became a weapons guy. And I uh, started off at Eglin Air Force Base uh, down in, down in uh, Fort Wall Beach, Florida on the test wing. Um, and it was during my time there that I met my bride, uh, which was uh, probably the best decision I made is somebody that's tolerated me for, for 30 years now. And we've kind of gone from there. But then up to Eielson Air Force Base, Alaska, by Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, loading bombs on A-10s. And this is important for later on is, you know, I can remember every Wednesday, basically, this is right at the end of the Cold War, 1993, um, and really kind of thinking about how do we do you know, these integrated combat turns and hot pits and, you know, how do you quick launch jets back to respond to Russian incursions? And it was still in that mindset, if you will, in the, in the early to mid 90s, just coming out of Desert Storm and and just kind of did that. I had applied at the time. Um, special ops for flyers was a special duty assignment. So I had applied twice and they only took four people, you know, one year and I had an assignment up to Alaska. So finally, in 1995, I was we had 96 people apply. Uh, they took seven, and I was one of the ones that was that was selected there in '95. So came down to you know it was called Commando Look, a, a poor man's version of a, of a pre-assessment, if you will. You know, you do the PT test, yeah, you, you do a quick psych profile, you do a couple of interviews, and then they determine whether or not you're going to fit. I was selected for the 16th Special Operations Squadron. Got ready to PCS uh, down to Herbert from Alaska, and and they were just standing up the fourth Special Operations Squadron, the U models. So moved over to the U models, uh, really right at stand up. And then uh, after checking out, went right to Bosnia, you know, and just paraphrasing, skipping through four deployments to Bosnia, you know, in the mid to late 90s, a totally different type of conflict. You know, as we were looking for war criminals and, and enhancing safe zones and some of those other pieces. And uh, while there, I uh, did an LNO job at the Siege of Soda in Sarajevo. And uh, that's where I kind of started my planning, which were for, for an air crew guy becomes a little different. At this point, I started embedding with some of the ground forces, kind of working, you know, the ground ops and some of those pieces. So driving through Sarajevo on my last, uh, my last deployment, kind of pre setting up in the event that we do a CCT or attack P or anybody else in there, just surveying and some of those pieces. We weren't going to shoot there, but we never knew. We didn't know that at the time. Felt like every day was about ready to be the next shooting war. Right. And, and now you realize just how different it was. Um, you know, in, in 98, I went to Oman um, and then over to Jordan and a couple other places. I became the central command planner uh, for the, at the time, the first special operations wing. And then into special missions plans where I worked, uh, you know, a lot of just very sensitive kind of national mission type, sent, you know, spe basically special missions. And in August of 2001, um, I was put on an interesting 
interesting assignment, if you will, with uh, with some of our, our our other folks, and it was really monitoring illegal arms shipments coming out of Pakistan and some other places, just you know, in very very generic terms. So I got home August twenty first, two thousand one, and on September tenth, two thousand one, I was out with the Norwegian soft out on our ranges out on out on out at Hurlburt out on Alpha seventy seven for both folks who know our ranges, and then we went you know out in the town. Um, got to bed at four thirty in the morning, and you know, at nine o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call. Get up because you know the second plane had just hit the towers. And, um, a week later, I was in I was in Oman. We were basically resetting up. You know, I was part of the first wave in, and then I was the first U.S. guy into Pakistan to set up the interagency uh, coordination piece because of my familiarity with the guys in Islamabad and Peshawar. So I set up Jacobabad guys like uh, Colonel Mike Flatten and uh, and um, uh, then then. Major Eric Ray, right? Those are the guys that, that I basically, uh, you know, work side by side with. A lot of a lot of your compatriots and, and uh, great friends of mine still to this day. Um, you know, and then and then a series of events happened. I wound up uh, I wound up by uh, getting exposed to microwave radiation over there in Pakistan. So uh, ended up with leukemia. Um, me and a couple other guys became medevac. So I I became a guest of Walter Reed um, for a couple months. Went through chemo and then down to down to Keesler Air Force Base for another 10 months of chemotherapy. Um, came out of that, I was going to be medically discharged, uh, fought it, um, and, and uh, was able to stay in service. So a couple of years later, I was able, then they told me you'd never fly again. So the goal was just to, the goal was to stay in service. Then the goal was to fly. Then the goal was to deploy, you know, and, and what, achieved all those goals and 10 deployments more later after that. Um, you know, I went and stood up our senior enlisted academy late in 2008, early 2009, uh, down here in Tampa. You know, kind of from there, picked up my command chief job and and uh, out of Kirtland Air Force Base. And it's I've been an ops guy my whole life. And they told me, you're going to Kirtland. And I was like, Kirtland, right? Like, that's training. Like, I don't do training. I do ops, right? <laughs> and they're like, hey, listen to me. You know, I got hit a couple times in the head. This becomes really, really important. And I realized how important that was going to Kirtland as the command chief out of Kirtland and really understand how we prepare and develop warriors to fight our nation's wars, right? And that was really, I had a, a gross underappreciation for education and training in, in terms of the development model. Um, so I became a absolute convert. And then Jared, like you said, I went off to, to, to uh, Stuttgart, um, Special Operations Command Europe as the senior enlisted uh, leader out there. And it was interesting because that was right when, um, and I know I'm giving you a lot here, probably too much, but it was right when uh, it was right when Russia invaded Crimea, right? So I was the first U.S. guy into Ukraine, and at the same time we had foreign fighters flowing up out of Syria as ISIS was blowing up. So I was down in Turkey on the border. So I spent my first, you know, half of my tour bouncing between Turkey and the Balkans, and then up in the Baltics and in Ukraine, kind of setting up the Eastern Front and the Southern flow of foreign fighters or, you know, countering Russian aggression, if you will. Um, and so that was really an educational piece. Then moved over to NATO and I was the NATO Special Operations Command um, Senior Enlisted Leader, or NATO Special Ops Headquarters. And then from there to AFSOC and then finally to here. Interesting part about here is I was already hired to be the United States Air Forces in Europe Command Chief. So I was going to leave AFSOC. We were going back to Germany. My wife was super happy, right? Woohoo, back to, back to Europe. The general Clark, called, <laughs> general, general, yeah, general Clark called out of the blue and said, uh, "Hey, you know, you interested in being the SOCOM senior enlisted leader?" And I mean, what do you say, right? It's it's yes, it's, it's the ultimate job. <laughs> well, I said I got to check with my That's wife, right? Because right? I may be in trouble. And like a good trooper, she supported me always. So I know that was long winded, but that's there you go. There's 31 years of me. Yeah, definitely. That I mean, that's a lot to talk about a large time frame in that five minutes. And for those yeah. people that are listening out there, you know, he breezed through all that stuff, but it was just amazing to hear all the places that he's gone, the things that he's done. You think, you know, like Jared was talking about in the beginning, a specific job and you're like, oh, they're probably just going to be on the flight line, not doing much, that kind of thing. But, you know, you turned it into all of these other things that you got to do throughout your career. And it's awesome to hear all that stuff. So, and that's my favorite part about the Air Force is that everything is an adventure and it is what you make of it. So you just continue to grow and learn and make yourself into the person that you want to become. So again, thank you for coming on and uh, talking us, talking to us about that background. Um, so you've been through, you know, tons of wars and deployments and all that stuff over the past 31 years, like you were talking about. Um, and one of the things that we want to kind of hit on 
early on in this conversation is, um, you know, the comprehensive review that soft did, um, on itself just to make sure after, you know, 20 years of being in combat after nine 11 and everything, um, all of us have kind of been through that. And I want it to be like a kind of a discussion because obviously everyone has their own experiences on this same topic and everything. So we did this, uh, comprehensive review and there were some findings that came out of this thing. And, I just want to get your take or everyone's take on, uh, you know, if you think SOCOM as a whole has a problem with any of these or, you know, the high, high yield type of topics that we need to fix right away, things that are on your radar, that kind of stuff based on this review. So um, the first one, and these are what it says verbatim from the thing. Uh, first one was lack of accountability after 20 years of fighting. And I, I think it's talking about, uh, you know, just taking care of our, our guys and making sure that, you know, these are one of these long wars when, you know, you read a lot of books like on killing that kind of stuff. And it talks about how if guys are in a combat situation for a prolonged period of time, there's a higher rel uh, relative rate of PTSD, all that kind of stuff. And I don't think anyone went into this thing thinking that we were going to be there for that long, but you know, it ended up just being, you know, continuing, continuing, deploying and deploying and deploying. And, uh, we all kind of lived through that. So what do your, what's your take on, uh, you know, just does SOCOM as a whole have a problem with, the lack of accountability and what are we doing to fix it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great, first of all, it's a great question. I'll, let me take you back 10 years um, real quick to, to the, the 8th of February, 2011, right? And Admiral Olson speaking before a symposium and he talked about soft fraying at the edges. That's the first time we had heard that term fraying at the edges and nobody, nobody really knew it that much. And it was really more about the army, right? The seven months in, seven months out, seven months in, the ODA is just pumping. I mean, they were pumping their cycle. You know, the, the SEALs have an you know, individual deployment training cycle, the IDTC that they follow, MARSOC does. You guys do ST, special warfare in general, does a very good job with it's kind of a three to one training cycles. But as a whole, if you place this in time and space, in 2011, we were just coming out of the big surge in Iraq, about to surge in Afghanistan, because as we were coming out, and then three, so we had a chance that to, it was an inflection point. And then in 2014, as we were getting ready to enact some of these changes, what happened? ISIS. Then in 2017, as we were on the backside of the, the push, still important, but still push, the backside of that, what happened? North Korea. Everybody thought we were going to war in North Korea in, in 2017. We started going, hey, man, the de-escalation drill is not going the way we thought it was going. So let's start getting ready. And, and all of you know, we started really looking at hard problem sets. And then now into 2020, as we look at strategic competition and, and you know, the national defense strategy challenges. So in all of that, we were still pumping hard in terms of counter VEO. And you guys think about all of your deployments and places you've been and how we've disaggregated our force down into small, small elements. And think of it, LT, for you, think of it from a, from a squadron commander perspective. How often was that Lieutenant Colonel Squadron Commander located anywhere near his or her troops? I mean, it's extremely rare. And then when you start getting off cycle, well, I'll just take you know the 2-1 STS, just picking an STS, right? So you may have had the 2-1 scattered across the globe in multiple embedded units. And it may then get pushed to a secondary mission where the commander, so you'll go a year with the commander not seeing some of those forces. So force accountability, you know, became, people ask me this question all the time. Do we have a problem, right? Does soft have a problem? And General Clark's answer is we do not, and this is important, we do not have a systemic problem. It's not soft gone wild. Right. And right. all this stuff you're reading in the papers today is recycled news. Then there'll be one incident that then we just bring up all the recycled news over 10 years and it gets sensationalized again. I say a little bit different. I say we have a problem with a couple of our people in our formation causing problems. So from a leader perspective, yes, we have a problem with a couple people causing problems. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's definitely not systematic for sure. I mean, you know. Um, it, it's just like anything, whether it's firemen, police, military in general, SOCOM, you know, they, there are going to be a very small percentage that are bad actors, if yeah. you will. So to, to say that SOCOM has a systematic problem, I think is, is not accurate at all. 
But Jared, this becomes important from a leader perspective. And this is you guys level leader, not me. I am too removed, right? I'm up here in the ivory tower. It's too far. I seriously, I do not have the touch points, which is one of my greatest frustrations that I used to have that I like you that I grew up knowing all the guys and gals in the unit. I knew who had life happening around them. I knew who was most likely to, to get in trouble, right? We all know that you can all think of two or three of those names right now in your head. But as you get further removed, I'm Peach's name. Exactly. Peaches, Peaches was like, Aaron, Peaches was like, I know it. And he was like, Aaron is my problem child. So at least, at least we're here every week, you know? So here's the, so, you know, to Lieutenant Silva's point, here's the, here's the challenge though. What if Aaron is the most tactically proficient member in our, on our team, right? He's the best shooter. He's the best runner. He's the best, you know, his terminal guidance is better than anybody. He's the best PJ, best special reconnaissance, whatever, right? He is the most competent member and he has a magnetic personality. So the guys flock to him, right? Natural leader, but his moral compass may be on magnetic north versus true north. Does that make sense? So he's still... For the most part, he's going in the right direction, but over time, it starts to wander off. And now we have this disparity, or he's on the wrong data. You know, Aaron's running Clark 1866, and we're all on WGS 84. We got a problem when we get to a precision point, right? You guys like those casts? Yeah, yeah. I threw that out for you guys. We're going to talk, we're talking Nat 27, (laughs) like whatever. (laughs) No hatches, am I right? But I just bring this up because confidence over character right, is what we have valued, where right now we're at an inflection point about character being the central theme. I think one of the important things that you were talking about there is, you know, when I was, uh, I first made staff sergeant at the unit, um, I got assigned to a individual who I was supposed to be supervising, but as soon as they got there, they deployed, and then I deployed, and we weren't even on the same rotation cycle, and it just kind of spun out like, I'm supposed to be supervising this dude. And I have really never met him before. Like I'm writing this EPR on him. He's been deployed and it's like, okay, uh, we should switch it over. Cause I've, I haven't met this guy. We need to, someone else needs to do his EPR. And I think a lot of that was happening with the rapid deployment cycles. Like you were talking about, and it's just, you know, you go out and eight deployments later, you're like, okay, I don't even know who was at the unit when I was there. Half the team was gone and we were on opposite rotations. It was the same with, I mean, Aaron was on a separate team than me. And so we never really got to hang out. We were at the same unit, but, uh, we didn't go years. Yeah. Like literally years without being in the unit together. Yeah. So that yeah. is exact. That's the crux of it right there about, so when you hear this president engaged leaders, what general Clark means by that is how do I provide time at echelon? You know, from your supervisor to the flight chief or the element you know, leader, all the way up to the commander. How do we provide it where you have engaged and present leaders? Back? And it's unfair because guys like me who remember the 90s, in a lot of ways, it was that way before Desert Storm. I'm, I am the last enlisted airman, believe it or not, here in June. I will be, number one, the longest serving enlisted airman in our Air Force and the last one that came in before Desert Storm. So think about that in terms of perspective. Of all of the enlisted airmen in the Air Force, active duty, 267,000, I'm like survivor, right? I'm outlasted, (laughs) right? But but there's been three transition points throughout there, just Air Force-wise or DOD-wise and then soft-wise. One was underemployment where you had time. We did 100 exercises for every op you did. Now you do 100 ops for every exercise you do. Now think about, and all of your ops, are direct action focused. They all end with something kinetic. So we have conditioned a generation of kinetic minded, not right or wrong, it's just the reality of it, of kinetic minded, bias for action, singular internal value system because the leaders weren't always aggregated or co-located with you. Still incredibly proficient warriors and leaders. However, Sometimes the value of the individual takes place over the value of the Constitution or the ROEs. And you all know what I mean by that. And that becomes hard. It's easy to do right here on a podcast. If you're Aaron sitting out, you know, you know, overseas, the further you get from garrison, the harder the decisions to get when the more murky it gets in terms of 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 what is right and wrong, for lack of a better term. And I don't that's a gross oversimplification. Well, I mean, I remember Chief. Uh, sorry, Brian. That's all uh, back, back when it was super busy, I had a commander tell me that 
he was sending me out the door and he's like, you're like a fire and forget guy. Like that was a compliment. And I think that kind of like that saying just kind of sums up the entire problem, you know, like, and, and it was, it was a compliment. Like I get to, to send you out and forget about you until you come back. And like, they were either not interested in what was happening or they had so much stuff on their plate that they were just happy to have a guy that they could blow out there, you know, and I could do whatever I wanted basically when I got out there. Um, so I, I, yeah, I just want to put that out there. That's, that's the mentality. I think that that's exactly what I was going to say too, you know, and when you get fired and forgot about, and it was kind of uh, the same thing at England because we had so few PJs and it was just like, all right, go out there. And then we're kind of raised by our step moms and dads, like, you know, whoever we attached to basically and whatever trouble they got into, obviously we wanted to get into the same thing because we were younger and uh, you know, you can mold this same behavior over a long pattern of time. You're just, in and out the door, no one's supervising you. You're with your friends, kind of doing whatever you want to do, and uh, you can kind of lose some of the leadership aspect and not have somebody with a continuous, you know, hold of you and making sure that all right, let's readdress and re-examine where you're at as far as the leadership ability. And that was the next thing. Um, so there's there was four findings here. I just wanted to say these because we're kind of bleeding into all of them. But yeah. insufficient uh, enlisted officer development, and then kind of. Uh, focus on deploying on the mission and, and the mission. And I think, um, a lot of that is, you know, we joined this job to do the mission, to get out there and do everything we can with our hands, help our, our guys come home and, you know, do everything we can as far as you want to be in the mix, we want to be right there on the front lines kind of thing. And, uh, sometimes it's hard to kind of, you lose a little bit of that leadership aspect. We don't have a person over your head, making sure that you're actually learning the lessons and not just, you know, focusing on dropping bombs or getting your hands bloody. Yeah, I need you tactically proficient, obviously. Um, you know, two very short vignettes, 30 second vignettes, if that, but 1997 Airman Leadership School, combat controller, Levito Award awardee at Airman Leadership School, perfect uniforms, perfect haircut, completely engaged. 2017, I'm the AFSOC Command Chief. I got into Airman Leadership School, not calling anybody out. That that combat controller, least, least sharp uniform, least engaged, you know, so it's because we have, we have revalued the bias for action and deployment as the whole person, whereas it's leadership across the board and it's leading in everything. So, so how do we get, how do I retain that, that sharp warrior and yet also make that PJ or that special reconnaissance airman or, or whatever, pick, pick an airman. How do I make it where you're, you know, you don't shine boots anymore. We don't starch uniforms anymore. We don't do any of that stuff. And I know it sounds silly, but it's not, it's about the little things that we do operationally that we don't do in vignette anymore. And then the second vignette I'll give you is, and you are all be able to nod. I'm sure of it. How many of you have either waived or been waived from attending PME due to the op cycle, right? Screw it. We'll get nope. to PME. Not, up in, not <laughs> up in here, Chief. That's good. Not up in here, baby. That's I've good. actually gotten more than I've deserved, and I blame the Chief Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> I actually still have to go to OTS in a month, so. That's good, right? <laughs> oh, I look forward man. to it. But, so, but, but the I, point I is, yeah, go ahead, Jared. No, no, no. I, I did want to say, like, as we transition to a different topic, I, I didn't want to put, I think it's a fine line between, uh, you know, fire and forget, trusting your people to do the right thing and micromanagement. Like, and I, and, and it, it gets blurred all the time. Yes, we should hold people accountable. We should also trust our people to do exactly what they, what they need to do at that time, you know? So, um, it is definitely not a micromanagement type of thing. So that, think of this as doing a control all delete right now, right? We're doing a reset of the force. Okay. Supervisors at echelon. We are all going to get intrusive real quick here just to set our baseline, all right? And then uh, we'll, you will see some immediate problems and you will see some aggregated problems. Okay, we can fix the immediate ones, whether they're individual or operational. We'll work through those or are they structural? Always ask this question, all of you. This is a fundamental leadership thing. Is it me? In other words, did the individual do this or is it we? Did the institution do this? Did we say, screw it, this stuff's not important as an institution? Or did that individual say, screw it, I don't think that's important? That becomes important for you as a leader. So just think, 
How do I fix the structural institutional stuff so I can get rid of we? We should never be the problem. So now as an individual, I should say, okay, the problem is me. Therefore, I need to take corrective action. Does that make sense? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. It that, makes total sense, I'm Chief. And I, I, well, and I think the people, the whole, you know, soft community as a whole, I'll tell you from the people in my halls, the people in my spaces, the people that I'm talking to, even the people that aren't inside of the tribe, so to speak, inside of SOCOM, inside of AFSOC, inside of the special operations world. Everyone is talking about the stand down. Everyone is talking about the findings. Everybody is talking about, oh, did you hear about the diversity and inclusion review? Did you hear about General Slife's comments? Did you hear about this? Like it is it is we're being bludgeoned over the head with it. And what I think is that people have lost sight about why we're doing this is because we're at an inflection point. We are about to move into one of the hardest mission sets we've ever done. And by the way, GWAT was cool blowing things up for 20 years in far-flung countries in CENTCOM. It looked awesome on Instagram. I'll be honest with you. It was sweet. <laughs> but we're moving into something with near-peer adversaries where we're about to really get after it. And unless we completely reorganize the way that we're doing, we did this review and we did the stand-down. Like, I I felt the pain of this stand-down for the last two years. You know, personally, I was really close to a lot of the events. Professionally, it was a hard time for me to be a leader. It was hard for me to figure out, like, where does where does the career field change? We I don't even have the same AFSC anymore. Right. I'm a one Zulu and no, not no longer a one Tango. And I connected with that. You know, add in all the other drama about talks about beret changes uh-huh. and what yeah. what what does AFSPEC war mean and why am I not allowed to call it a troop? Like all of these things, people kind of lose sight that we're going into great power competition. For the people that don't understand, you know, w- what is great power competition? Because we said it before, GPC. Can you give us like the layman's terms? Because what I want to do is I want to frame what we just talked about, all of those things. Hey, no kidding. This is we are we are changing things fundamentally in order to get after this new mission set. And I want to talk about that mission set, kind of define it before we dive into it. Yeah. So, you know, great power competition or really strategic competition, or you're going to start hearing this term more and more. You're hearing it from me first. You will start hearing this a lot. Trans regional cross-domain deterrence, right? This is big policy stuff, right? That's filtering down into the combatant commands that will filter down. So really strategic competition in the political space, great power competition in the national defense strategy space, kind of merging and you're all hearing the buzzwords, but trans-regional cross-domain deterrence, right? So when you look at competition holistically, um, You know, we define, and I'll just use China in this case, you know, recognize an unclassed forum and all that stuff. But China is a pacing threat right now, is a pacing challenge, right? They are not an adversary. They're a strategic competitor that have the ability to become an adversary at any moment. So how do we compete in those spaces? And how do we, you, right, how do you help provide the indications and warnings on a strategic level? So how do we characterize the nature of China globally from a military lens? to its economic and information aspects and how it's moving out. And I can talk that for two hours, but I will just tell you, competition for us is really about being the access and placement experts, whether it's the embassy, whether it's in a nation with our partners and allies, or whether it's along very, very sensitive uh, lines of, of operation that allow us to characterize the nature of, of the, the threat. We will no longer be the supported actor, right? The Oscar awardee. We will now be the best supporting actor, hopefully, you know, in a good culminating drama, not in a tragic comedy, right? So, so I ask you, (laughs) I ask you to think about that as how do you, how do you become, you know, the best supporting actor, you know, in in an Academy Award? And then my last point is how do we build Super Bowl teams to do this, not Pro Bowl teams? How do we build Super Bowl teams to do this? Yeah, I love it. And we get this question all the time. And it's always it's always cased in like this. Like the people that follow us, the people that are that are really getting after it, that are training right now to come in, they're like, hey, I was kind of like sold this this GWAT dream of kicking in doors and shooting people and clearing compounds and doing all this stuff. There's always going to be a place for that in SOCOM. Shoot, move, communicate, and lead. Those are those are our main food groups. We're never going to get away from it. So how do we bridge the gap between shoot, move, communicate, and lead, and really turning that person, that raw material, into that Super Bowl contender? What do they need to be focusing on? 
Yeah, we went through this 10 years ago, which is why we stood up the Senior Enlisted Academy, right? Um, and the big thing, I, you know, as, as we work to get Aaron back, but as the, the big thing that, um, you know, that we continue to work on here is kind of that 3D warrior, right? Diplomacy, development, and defense. So I've got to be ready at any moment to flip the switch and be your worst nightmare kinetically. But, you know, but at the same time, my diplomacy and how I engage, how do we develop, right? For you guys, AGI, you know, big thing with Aaron is that air to ground integration piece of this with allies and partners, emerging partners. There are so many opportunities here, but what I can't have is, you know, ST gone wild at the same time. So blending kind of, you know, comprehensive review into this is we've got to have the best developed, best disciplined, best prepared folks to do this. And once we have that, we're going to go and do some really hard things based on, based on those, you know, those, those, the nature of the things that we're being asked to do. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, Chief, I think it, I think it makes sense. One, one of the things I think that from my perspective, what I see a problem is, is we all came up through GWAT all of our EPRs, OPRs, the way you get promoted, the way you get recognized is based on very specific things and the, the deployment cycle and all that other stuff. Like, how are we going to break that cycle to focus on this, this GPC environment? You know what I mean? Like, I, I know you, you said you stood up the, uh, the Senior Enlisted Academy, but how long is it going to take us to really turn that mental corner into this, this new area where we're going and then help us to focus on uh, being special ops versus being just, you know, glorified, you know, dork kickers and, yeah. uh, and, and basically rangers with, with other skills. Yeah, there's time. 13 core activities, right? And we kind of really focus on two of them in a lot of ways, right? Really DR and CT. We don't focus on the other 11 of them. And, and so, you know, I will tell you this, in the special warfare community, you have the ability to instantly change that, right? Because we have become so We've overvalued, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to undervalue it either. Right. We've overvalued the Bronze Star with Valor, you know, over the decision not to shoot. Does that make sense? And I, I want to be careful on that because I don't want you, I'm using a double negative, I don't want you to not shoot, you know, but I don't want you to be so prone to kinetic that you can do that. And, and, and you know, see, to your point on, on, how do we evaluate and promote this? I think in ST, you're starting to see this more and more right now. Chris Grove is doing a great job in terms of visualizing this. Jeff Gilmain, great personal friend of mine. We really talked about how do we reorganize the kind of the promotion boards and what do we value in terms of strategic reconnaissance, indications and warnings and development? How, how do I take a JTF IP mission and make that as important as a you know resolute support mission if that makes sense so and that right is now, extremely notice, important yeah they're not valued the same right internally they're not valued the same and in a lot of ways externally they're not but i will tell you here in the next in the next couple of months when there is no resolute support mission which will be interesting and it's a whole nother discussion for another time right so <laughs> as, as decision makers still make decisions on those things but you know Aaron will tell you what's the future of just of Somalia or even East Africa you know now that we're yeah. in the neighborhood not on the block right oh you know yeah. and I, good yeah and I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you this has been I, I just said this to peaches no kidding you know two days ago I was like chief we are getting after it down here. It looks completely different, maybe from the outside looking in, if you wanted to be contrarian about it, or if you want to be like, oh, you guys aren't going kinetic at all. The work that we're able to do, the things that we're doing down here is mind blowing. It's a testament to the guys and their work, but more so where we're going. So here's where I'm most excited, right? And Trent, to your point on this one is, if I give you a hard problem, here's the one thing I know about special warfare and soft in general, operators writ large. If I give you the problem and I and I value the solutions that you're going to come up with, you are going to solve a range of options to get after that problem. We have got to stop up here. And this goes back to Peach's part about trust and empowerment. So I got to micromanage you a little bit through the transition as we set the force. It's never a fun time going through change. It's not fun for me either. It isn't. Trust me. This is not what I signed up to do either. I was expecting <laughs> a completely different tour, right? So <laughs> I got screwed. I want my money back for this tour, by the way. So, you know. Checks in the mail. Exactly. 
But you know, as I kind of <laughs> yeah, wait for that overtime check, Chief. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. But as as, as I kind of start my last year, you know, kind of at SOCOM, um, you know, as I prepare to transition out, and this will be it for me. I'll retire next year and and hand you know hand the baton to the next to you guys. And I I feel very comfortable doing that. But I got to make sure that you guys have the historical context of it before I walk out the door. And then you're able to compartmentalize it. And I give you the time and space to solve that problem. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to this year. Well, I mean, chief, as we, we move into next year, you know, what, what, what are you seeing for the next 10 years? You know what I mean? So like we, you, you kind of glossed over the Afghanistan thing. I don't know if you don't want to talk about that, but it's on my <laughs> sheet of paper here that I'm supposed to ask you about it. <laughs> <laughs> but as as we move forward and, and we close down Afghanistan, what are what are the big ticket items that you're seeing um, that you know you won't have to personally solve as the C cell? But you know, once Chief uh, Petrus gets up there, what what is his problem going to be? Exactly. So okay, so a couple of big pieces here. Okay, briefly on Afghanistan. The reason I'm I'm not kind of going in is decision makers are still making decisions on on what that looks like. We look. We absolutely support the president's decision, first and foremost. The commander-in-chief is the commander-in-chief, right? So we are apolitical on all of that. You know, so from our military leaders' perspective, we provided best military advice and the risk to nation at the end of the day at that level, right? What's the risk to America of the decision? The National Security Council took that advice, gave it to the president. The president is our commander-in-chief, made a decision. Roger that, sir. We're moving out. So we are in the midst of moving out on that decision. Uh, you know, we are concerned about, you know, what happens next, right? In terms of threat to the homeland, first and foremost, and then proliferation of violent extremist or violent extremist ideology, destabilization of the region and those other factors of other state actors as well, right? So, so decision makers are still working through what that looks like, whether it's you know, diplomatic, is there some sort of military assistance? Is it, is it, you know, is it a FID, you know, or is it a, uh, is it a, do we help continue to train the Afghans after this? Do we, you know, all of those things still have to be decided out or is it just, Hey, see you later, you know, like, you know, you know, talk, talk to you soon. Good luck. Right. I mean, so we're somewhere in between all of those things of some sort of habitual relationship, not a presence, what a relationship. And so, so I'll just tell you that the concern right now in the range of military options that are being developed, walk through each of those scenarios and they're still in development. So, so I'll leave that piece there. Iraq is no different, right? In the sense of what is the future of Iraq? We don't want to be in Iraq forever. So how do we continue to help um, the Iraqis in the defense or the defeat ISIS mission, which is our mandate of why we're there, right? Is train, advise, assist to defeat ISIS. It's not anything else. So we keep, you know, there keeps getting misconstrued in the media and everything else about making it something else. And then in the Eastern Syrian security area is something a little different, right? Of, of making sure, you know, our partners, in that case, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and it's a you know, between Turkey and Russia and Iran and Syria and all the different actors that work in that area, the possibility of miscalculation. So you're asking me what the next two years is, is, is flushing through policy and our ability to support whatever the president's decision is based on that military advice of what those things look like while still making sure we, we, you know, we take care of our allies and partners along the way. Long-term trend, to your point, is if you look in 2030, right? If you've not read um, or looked, this isn't pick, picking it, but there's two books I would read, right? I would read The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek, and I would read China's Asian Dream by a guy named Tom Miller. If you have not read that book, I would strongly encourage you to read that book. Um, China's Asian Dream by Tom Miller. It's a 250-page book, quick read, but it really talks about the blog that is Chinese influence really moving out across multiple corridors. So when you couple that with, with China's increase, and this is all unclass generic stuff, right? I mean, it's not even the really scary brief, but, but in a generic sense, if you look at China's 
um, upgrade in their in their submarine capability, for example, with the Type 94s, the Jin class going into this Type 96 submarine, their sea launch ballistic missile program, their air launched and medium range ballistic missiles. As China pushes out its capability beyond the first and second island chains, which is where we kind of keep looking, but you really have to look whole, holistically in whole of world. What are they doing in space? What are they doing in cyber? How did they reorganize? Read the last four Chinese defense white papers that talk about reorganization, countering our NDS and what they're going to do. Put those pieces together. I have to give you time to understand the characterization of that so we can prep the force to counter and, if necessary, compete and defeat. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's a it's a insane problem to try and solve, and I, I'm not sure that we will ever get it 100% right. But So from your point of view... You know, what what role do you see soft playing in that? Like what you're talking about specifically with those multiple domains? Yeah. So so first of all, you know, form follows function, right? We are optimized right now for a VEO fight across soft formations. We are. We're optimized to to do that. So you're going to see some structural changes. And so I don't know what they are. Each component commander is, you know, you guys know General Slipe is starting an internal look at AFSOC holistically. General Webb at AETC is looking at, okay, how do we support that? You know, the, the, the discussion of rescue to AFSOC and all those other things, which is a dead issue, you know, but, <laughs> but what does special warfare 2030 really look like? Right. Do you do we put on net operators and cyber operators? You know, um, you, you know, what what does that do? I do I add? Do I change? Do I remove this? Do our special reconnaissance airmen really kind of pick up that cyber mission as you know, as we've kind of tinkered with that? Do I absorb that into a CCT hybrid piece? You know, um, you know, what about ATP cards? How important are they now for PJs and 18 deltas? Right. The gift that keeps giving. Right. As I continue to look at the Delta course. Right. And how those things work. So so what is required of our of our form? Right. Is going to depend on what am I asking you to do? So as we go through the mission analysis of strategic competition, trans regional cross domain deterrence. Right. What does that mean? And then how do we do this? And I will tell you that I can think three ways right now that you guys today will do that. Number one is characterizing the environment. And what I mean by that is what is the cyber? What is the terminal guidance? What is your ability to use ATAC in a peer environment? What, what about the one, 152 versus a 163? How does battery life work on extended island hopping? What about the Arctic? How am I doing offset? infill in a contested environment, meaning I'm going to be 5, 10, 15 days come out because precision targeting is not going to allow me to do that. How do I feed? How do I resupply? How do I do all those things? I need you guys practicing those things as a unit right now. And then how do I, how do I link mesh networking on this end, mesh networking on this end, and maybe alternative means to link the two? Right? How do I do that in pretty hard, challenging environments? So we need to be able to experiment while retaining our core skills. And I can't do that under your current PMT cycle. Make sense? This, no. this Was, last... Is that it, Chief? Is that, is that all you needed? Is that <laughs> it? me going tactical. Was, oh, okay. yeah. No, that's fine. That was me going no, tactical. That's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's fine. No, it's, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll have that knocked out. Does like close the business Wednesday sound yeah, good? Yeah. Or what's, good, what's good for but, you? So what's now you but, but now you understand why, why we got to pull you off the battlefield and give you the time. We got to give you the time to internally look at your kit. Go to, you know, 10th group just did, we were just up at Fort Carson two weeks ago. So 10th group went up to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, did a minus 50 degree offset uh, C-17, air, you know, free fall airdrop. And guess what happened? Took almost 2,000 2, feet for opening sequence on the RA1s, right? Because everything froze, all right? What does that mean on an infill, on a hard infill, hard, you know? And by the way, all the risers and toggles froze. Instant opening shop, dew point, right? Difference between the C-17 and out in the air. And that's in a dry environment. What are we going to do up in the Kuril Islands or somewhere, you know, North Japan? Something along those lines. They also dove underneath seven feet of ice, Right, twenty, you know, twenty to thirty minutes underneath seven feet of ice up there in the Arctic. Think about that, right? That's just Arctic. Pass. 
hard pass. That's terrifying. Yeah. The ocean is terrifying as it is. And now I got a I got a roof over the ocean. Come on. That's let me guess. The roof was on fire. Exactly. What's next? Yeah, yes. yeah. Full full of Russians and Chinese trying to shoot you through it, right? So yeah, yeah. with ray guns, with ray guns, right? I don't know. I, I I told you guys uh, that this would be a, a very mind blowing conversation. I, I didn't tell the audience, but uh, I was telling <laughs> telling the guys beforehand. I was like, "You you guys are you don't know what you're in for. This is going to be a great conversation." That was the last ten minutes was by far the the most important of the podcast for sure. Let me frequency <laughs> happen right from taking all this. Like I spent half my time with Congress. Well, call it 20% of my time with Congress and making sure that we have the maneuver space. The next 10% of my time with, with you know, uh, other geographic or combatant commands, making sure that we're doing and we're, the force is arrayed properly. And it's never going to be enough because the requirements are insatiable, right? The bulk of my time is spent troops to task or strategy to task and then task to troops and then for me, as your interpreter, I've got to be 3-3 three, three on my language in terms of, of infill, exfil, kit, all of those things, because we do not have enough people here at the headquarters or place that can influence. I need two more guys working on hyper-enabled operator, right? I'm going to pull, I'm going to realign, and Jared, you know this, I'm realigning one of our CCT here in the headquarters that was doing something different to work hyper-enabled operator. I need that dude embedded with you guys doing an exercise, bringing a bunch of Gucci stuff saying, Hey, test this out, break it. So I can take it back and over here to, you know, to the mad scientist garage, if you will, you know, and then start tinkering to make sure that we're integrated with all that stuff. How do I get, how do I, I want to be, you know, so unclass, right. Always fun on class, but how do I get next generation data link, next generation freeze dried blood, right? Next generation cyber. How do I get those things integrated into your kits that allow you to go deeper, further, faster? My last point on hyper enabled, which is where I need you guys is to me, hyper enabled operators about three things. It's about power. How do I integrate battery life, whether it's to your kit or to you, right? And it's, this is about heat, duration, weight, um, and integration. I got. I can't carry 50 batteries for different things. I need one battery to power it all. And I don't need it to be a 5590 that has 12 minutes of life in the cold. As everybody <laughs> knows, we're all over at the, at the POTIF facility because the 5590 is in the bottom of my kit, right? Got it. I totally get it. So people who know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. Okay. If you Part know, you two. know. So power. Second one is projection. How do I, we got ATAX a great start, but how do I get you integrated into Maddle, into Link 16, get you over the horizon so you can see ground, air, everything around you integrated, whether it's, and you, you know where I'm at with this, but how do I secure that up and then, and then over communicate that? How do I practice and exercise those things and then make it where it's better? How do I put all of that information into your goggles? So you're not flipping down your ATAC and shining your face in the wrong spot. You guys know what I'm talking about there. So yep. it's about projection of power. And then the last one is protection. You know, we've got some new technology that will stop a 7.62 at 100 yards. Those plates weigh less than five pounds, right? So, so how do I get that integrated into you instead of an 11 or 13 pound plates? And you guys all know what I'm talking about because the plates plus the batteries really destroyed the L3, L4, L5, and your S1 is all pinching on you. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. So, so we put all those things together, power, protection, and projection. That is hyper-enabled operator going forward. Over. It really was harder when I did it. That's what I'm going to tell everybody. <laughs> Once I get those five-pound plates, I'm, I'm out. I'm not yep. being nice to any of those really kids ever was. again. Once I get those? Yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're working on it now, right? So that's that's the next technology. And again, what do, this goes back to the promotion discussion earlier. We need to overvalue the PJ working in hyper-enabled operator right now versus the PJ deploying on the deployment schedule. We va we will promote what we value and, and, the, and the guys see it, right? So there should be a fight of people getting into some of these jobs to get to the next ridge line, if you will. 
Oh, you're going to get me on a tangent if we were talking about that. We could talk about that for another hour. Yeah. Just on that specifically, putting people in the right place at the right time at the right organization. But I'm, Jared, um, you know I'm working on this, and it is. I know. I know. It is like pushing. <laughs> it is like pushing a snowball through hell, right? To get the assignment process responsive. And I have met the enemy. It is us. Yeah. Oh. Right. I, we you're are not going to hear me argue that first, both internally. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on my team, right? I'll pick on the SOCOM team, right? I go into the J1, our personnel section, our, our CSS or orderly room. Hey, I need these people moved. And man, it becomes a, well, we need to have a meeting on that. No, we don't. Right. <laughs> and then I, I'm TDY for the next three weeks and I come back and nothing has happened. Right. I have <laughs> met the, I have, I, I'm telling you, we, we, we take more people out of the fight than Al Qaeda ever will, right? So, so, you know, that's my. I'll, I'm not picking on my guys. I'm I'm trying to do that so I don't pick on anybody else. But, but we do internally screw ourselves up more than anybody else does. Yep, can't argue with that. So this this next question, Chief, would be, uh, I I would think would be difficult for you, but just knowing you, it, it might not be. So, what would be your what would you say your greatest challenge has been? as the C-cell and your great, conversely, your greatest accomplishment. Uh, what I'm going for is like what, so with the greatest those, accomplishment was getting you out of the headquarters, right? Now, yeah, so, well, because that was a win. Right? <laughs> that, that, that was a win. <laughs> no, the, uh, <laughs> but I mean, like what, what's your legacy? What, what legacy is chief Greg Smith leaving at SOCOM? Okay. So there's th three, three things on this one, right? One was I have implemented, um, talent management at the senior levels that we are now seeing come to fruition. So our TSOC senior enlisted leaders are now being purposely developed and placed in there. The roadmap for that, I started at the top because it's too hard to start where I want to start, which is at the E7. I just can't get there. But so we have a pretty good model now where in September, all of the senior enlisted leaders, my soft counsel, if you will, the component in TSA, we sit down and go through all the names, build out the slates, and it is very transparent. So I've removed the mystique behind it and made that transparent. That's number one. The second one is kind of refocus the value on education holistically to try and to try and really reset the mind. And you will see this push down. You you aren't coming, you're not coming to a TSOC senior enlisted leader position, unless you're a summit grad, unless you're this, unless you're that. So, so people are starting to understand where that fits in and value where it fits into their career map. Um, you know, this is my, one of my great friends, Pat McCauley, my predecessor, right? I just went out to dinner with him this past week. Pat's a great mentor of mine. I was able to continue um, kind of his integration with Congress. So, um, you know, we just had Joni Ernst on our podcast here this last week, Senator Ernst, you know, great, great advocate. And so um, the senior enlisted leader is now valued in the sense of from a congressional perspective of, of our opinion. So getting that done, which buys maneuver space. Guys, this has, I am dropping off the grid. You'll find me in a tree stand in Michigan in 15 months, right? I, I'm good, right? Everything I am doing is the set condition. So you guys have maneuver space. Then the third one for me um, was really, um, you know, this warfighter brain health, cognitive agility, and preservation of the force and family and kind of next is really setting conditions for that to start integrating holistic, right? If you notice, human performance isn't just about physical anymore. It's about the whole thing. It's all five domains. And I've got to do a better job. We need to have a better opportunity for you guys. I'll hand you, you know, or send you my five by eight little cards that, you know, that I, that I, that I make, you know, or have the guys make every month that give you kind of that, that setup on that. So my biggest failure was I was unable, and I, I say this as a failure. And I mean that honestly, I was unable to change the talent management resistance culture, right? It's an absolute failure on my part. And for two reasons, one is time. I just ran out of time. Right. My, I don't have a team, right. There's me and Kilo, right. But I don't have a team of, I don't have a CAG. I don't have all those things. And, you know, the, the component senior enlisted leaders are doing their thing for their right reason. It's, it's trying to get those things integrated is just, 
there's too many stray bolts right now. I just, I, I don't think I'll be able to get it there. And we're so close, but I'm going to fail. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I refuse to admit that or accept it, <laughs> but, but I, I suspect I will. And to this point, it's been my biggest failure. And then the last one is I have not spent enough time with the teams, right. Of applying all of this down at the 05, 04, 03 level of just having a conversation. Where do you do that? You do that on the range. You do that, you know, driving to and from the training event or the op or whatever that is. That's where you get all this, all the stuff done. And I just haven't had the time. Um, for me, it's been about time. That's so true. Uh, when you talk about being able to connect with, with the folks and you, being at the headquarters, it is tough for you. I mean, you guys, you know, you and General Clark are on the road constantly. Like, we're lucky we even have you right now because you're leaving out on Monday. But And this is a Saturday that we're doing this. But the other way that you are getting after it, and I, th I think it's fantastic, um, you guys have started up the SOCOM Softcast uh, yeah. with Sergeant Major Matt Parrish. And, you know, you, you guys are... What are you about six months in now? I, I think is is what you are. Maybe Just a little bit more. Episode, yeah, yeah, and it's fantastic because we get to hear. You know, the listeners get to hear directly from your point of view, being the SOCOM C cell, and then also you know um, Matt Parrish, who you know love the guy. He, he's like, oh, I'm coming at this from a team guy perspective, which is great because the dynamic that you guys have is fantastic, and that having that venue to where he can push back on you and and it be an open forum and there's obviously no retribution or anything like that. But I think that's important because then you're able to get kind of a, uh, a feel for what the force is feeling and going through, Just even in, if it's a snapshot, you know? Yeah, what I want is, and I, Matt will argue that there's no retribution as I pummel him, <laughs> pummel him mercil mercilessly daily, right? Matt is an amazing American and he's an excellent host and he does, he works so hard. And Teresa Coble, who just recently retired, our Sergeant Major, you know, she kind of started the concept and her and Matt, they worked really, really hard on that, right? And, and while I get some credit for it and yeah, I'm part of the meetings, the credit is Matt's. Right. And 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 really, he does all the prep and and really, really thinks about it. And you're right. He takes a very contrarian. So to the to your listeners, if you listen to Softcast, think of Matt as your Deox, as your climate assessment guy. Send him seriously, all of you send him a note, send him emails. Here's the topic I want. And here's why I think this is bull crap. Right. And Matt will. I will pummel him with a screwdriver. As you hear me. Right. I'm, I'm going to stab you with a <laughs> screwdriver because. Because I'm going to do that on purpose, right? I'm going to take, okay, you can do this, but here's the external cost of that, right? And it's just this balance of things. And that's what I like about this show as well is, is it, it, it provides this. What I fear for Softcast is it continues to gain popularity and you know, syndication is external. Ah, I think it should be this. It's supposed to be context about the issues by, by the force for the force, no, and I, I think that's why the like the shots from the field that you guys do that you know I was on one of the episodes and I feel like I I could have prepared better for that you know I could I could have brought more from shots from the field but um, I, whatever maybe next great time episode. maybe I'll get it maybe I'll get an invite back but uh, we'll, we'll get that. I think you did great <laughs> Peach you did great Chief don't you worry about we need that. to have all you guys on there right we'll do a we'll do a crossover episode like this but we'll interview oh. each other right. So like half and half the episode, I think that'd actually be interesting. Yeah. And, uh, just talking to both of you guys, uh, Sergeant Major Parrish and then yourself, Chief, it's just really awesome to hear that, you know, you're so connected from, you know, our level, you can, like you were talking about, translate to our level and kind of relate with everything that we're doing and that kind of stuff. And also, obviously you're doing really high level stuff, talking about geopolitical type, um, you know, organization and that kind of stuff. Um, but I can tell that from, you know, talking to both you guys that you really, um, care about everything that's going on with the force and, you know, you can identify your weaknesses and that's all of these things are things that we really preach on the, the podcast, you know, like, he's, like, you know, we are training guys to get ready for, to replace us and to be in your shoes, maybe one day, that kind of stuff. But these are all 
things that we we preach on personal accountability and then thinking from top to bottom being able to communicate being able to be personable all those things and i think you guys are a great example of it and we're just uh really glad and uh, honored that you guys came on the show and uh you know spread your knowledge so i just want to say thanks thanks right and get better about that so and that's how you grow and you're not there are, i promise you this um i'm not going to win the weightlifting competition or whatever else but but find through this journey, you'll find what your strength is and the beauty of special operations, you know, regardless of, you know, um, diversity and, and that is from special operations perspective, we are not talking about standards or anything else. The standards are the standards. We are talking about making sure we attract the very best America has to offer. So regardless of what you across the field, Targeting, but we've targeted and recruited a, a kind of a very select group of folks with very split. I want to make sure that we take that flashlight and widen the beam to make sure that we're not leaving anything on the table, right? Let's get everybody to the party. Everybody has an opportunity and the standards are the standards. And I hope, I hope by attracting America's best that we continue to recruit and retain America's best. That's where I'm at. Anything else, the standards are the standards. We are talking about making sure we attract the very best America has to offer. So regardless of what you across the field, but we've targeted and recruited a, a kind of a very select group of folks with very split. I want to make sure that we take that flashlight and widen the beam to make sure that we're not leaving anything on the table, right? Let's get everybody to the party. Everybody has an opportunity and the standards are the standards. And I hope, I hope by attracting America's best that we continue to recruit and retain America's best. That's where I'm at. And I don't disagree with that one bit, chief. Here, here. <laughs> There's I'm my point. Right. Yeah. Okay. So for you guys as leaders, anytime the guys and the folks down in the team rooms, they're instantly going to start talking about standards or assess. Did I say that? Did I, his general Clark have, we have not talked about standards once because the standard is the standard and that's a component level thing, right? We'll determine the standard based on the mission. Will it look the same going forward? I don't know, but I can tell you this, what made you will continue to make you. I just need to make sure I attract every possible person I can attract to come and, and try out for the dance and make them feel welcome with trying out. No, exactly. Di diversity makes us stronger. Yes. I mean, that's, that's why America is so strong and, and does whatever it does. Like, yeah. sorry very, to introduce very well. a new topic. Not that yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, so, so I won't go off on a tangent on that, but, uh, but I will wrap it up. Chief, uh, sincerely, I, you've been a mentor of mine for, for many years now, um, and I appreciate that, and, and it's an honor to have you on. It really is, um, and I hope that we can do it again in the future, um, and if I don't see you before you roll out, I'm, I'll definitely talk to you, but congratulations on you know being the SOCOM CSL and on your future retirement. Yeah, and being old is what you're telling me. Right. That's what he I said. Think everybody, right everybody's old face. on this he one. He said it right to you. I can't believe it. And pre doesn't storm kind of says it all. <laughs> doesn't it? I know that does. Doesn't it? Thanks, Trent. You're dead to me now, right? So <laughs> there's a standard that I'm getting rid of you, right? So, but yeah. Um, so I, I all can right, say everybody. that about being this. Thanks. For, yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. Have a good Thanks, one. Guys. Later. Thanks, Chief. Later.